I'm putting in some new fencing. My cattle are gonna be grazing this pasture later this spring and I need to have a permanent perimeter fence going around the whole area. And so I've been putting in these fence posts to get ready. But as I've been out here working, it really has me thinking about fences and farm fences specifically. And I've got something I wanna show you guys way over there. Okay, you guys see this right here? This is what I wanted to show you, all of this. It's a rock wall. Trust me, by the end of this, you will be as fascinated with stone walls as I am. We're gonna decide who really is the most boring YouTuber ever. We have a bunch of them around the farm. This is probably the most prominent one because it actually divides our main pasture from this secondary pasture that gets kind of wet and has started to go back to forest and scrub. And when you look at this rock wall, what you see is like thousands and thousands of stones piled up here like this. And these stones, I mean, some of them are relatively small and manageable. Others are kind of medium size, but some of them are pretty gosh darn big. I mean, there are some real boulders up and down this wall as you look at it. It's not just a boulder, it's a rock. And as I've been up here working on this new fence and realizing that this new fence pretty much just parallels the old fence, it really does give me a sense of connection because I know farmers of times past who work this farm, most notably the Shaw family. You know, the Shaw family were the ones who owned this farm from like the 1870s all the way to the 1970s. And that's why the place is called Gold Shaw Farm. Like I'm gold and they're Shaw. But as I was working on this fence, I ended up actually listening to a podcast talking all about rock walls by my friends over at Brave Little State. It's this really great podcast all about Vermont. I'll leave a link for the episode down below. They tried to answer the question of where do these rock walls come from and why are they here? And as I was listening to the podcast, I'm like, ah, that's a stupid question. It's obvious. They use those rock walls as walls for the farm and that's how they did their fencing. But then as I listened to the episode and thought about it more myself, you realize that that's kind of a dumb thought because the amount of work that it takes to stack those rock walls is not insignificant. You've got to, first off, acquire all of that rock. And then second, you need to be able to take all of that rock, fit it together and stack it nice and neatly in a pile that makes that rock wall. And now my rock wall has long since started to go back to nature and I'm just letting it do its thing. And there's probably about a dozen rock walls scattered around the farm, whether they be lining pastures or deep in the forest. And as I was listening to this podcast, I really came to realize that the story of stone walls in Vermont and New England and the Northeast in general really is one that connects geology, glaciers, native people, colonization, agriculture, and history like all in like one big stone wall soup. And yes, like I said, that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Because by the end of this video, what I wanna answer for you is how did this rock wall specifically end up in this specific spot on our farm? And why has it stayed standing for I don't know, at least 150 years, but maybe even longer, probably much longer. And so it really starts about 13,000 years ago when glaciers started to recede from here in Vermont. You see, like if you date back say 20,000 years ago, the spot I'm standing in right now would be covered in ice. And I'm not just talking like a usual winter snowpack. I'm talking about a mile thick layer of ice covering the spot I'm standing in now. But for about 7,000 years, that ice receded. And as that ice receded, what happened is it deposited rocks pretty much everywhere in this area. So yeah, I'm talking about this rock, which I don't know, I think is maybe quartz or some of that granite over there or some of those other gray rocks. I don't know their names. I am by no means a geologist, but the receding of those glaciers basically deposited those rocks all across everything that you see here behind me. And it was those glaciers receding that shaped the landscape here in Vermont. It's what gives us our mountains, which are really just the big rocks, and it created the erosion that makes our valleys and lakes and ponds and all that good stuff. And it scattered millions and millions of stones of wide variety, shapes, sizes, and constitution all across the land. And now about 10,000 years ago, once all the glaciers had receded, humans started to come into this area and they started to explore it. And 
the humans that were here are probably the descendants of the Abenaki. They mostly stayed around the river valleys and whatnot, and they would travel by boat up and down the river. They often traveled with the seasons in different parts of the region. Sometimes they had a little bit of agriculture and a little bit of fishing, but they did a lot of hunting in the forests here. And while they used a lot of these rocks for building things like tools, they didn't do a ton with them. They didn't move them. They were not the ones who were stacking these walls. They didn't really even have a sense of property, you know? You know, that concept of property was not something that existed here on this continent. I mean, heck, even going back about 700, 600 years ago, there was no idea of property here, like none of this. And so most of those rocks pretty much stayed right where they were. You know, a lot of this was forest. Sometimes they would burn it. They would create pastures, which created better hunting conditions. It also really helped balance and manage out the land. If you look around here now, most of the trees in this area aren't that big. A lot of them are like 50, 60 years old. You know, most of the trees right along the fence line here, they probably weren't even here 75 years ago. But then if you look at this giant old rotting maple here, this is the type of tree that was typically around. They were gigantic. I mean, this was probably a small one. And this one's probably been dead for about 40 years. And you can see it all on the ground. You can see it all up here. I haven't tried to destroy it because I kind of like it standing here. I feel like it's almost a time capsule to an era long since gone. But you could easily have trees like that coexisting and living within rocky, rocky soil. And in time, the trees would break down and turn into dirt. That dirt would then cover the floor and things would pile up. And as that process of decay would happen, it would create soil, which would help grow more trees and more plants. And it would bury these rocks deeper and deeper into the soil. And some of the rocks would be buried. Some of the rocks would be poking up and they would just stay here until... <clears throat> Oh, golly, God, that one's heavy. And they would pretty much just stay in place until some Europeans showed up and brought two key things with them that ultimately led to the construction of these walls. Number one, they brought the concept of private property and the idea that somebody could own the land and like somebody had a field that was their field. But then number two, and probably more important is they brought a heavier focus towards agriculture and they were planting crops like oats and rye and wheat. They were bringing animals like cattle and sheep into the area as well and having them graze. They were cutting some of that grass and storing it as hay to feed the animals in the winter. But it's really hard to till a field when there's rocks scattered everywhere. And so in order to be able to till the field, they'd have to pick up all of the stones that were out there and they would have to move them and put them somewhere. It's a hard life picking stones and pulling teats. And now I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever piled up stones or collected rocks, you'll know that it is pretty hard work and it's heavy, hard manual labor. And as they would be clearing a field, they would be looking for a place to deposit those rocks and they would often use it as a way to delineate between different fields. But they also didn't want to go too crazy and schlep those rocks all over the farm. And so so for example, when they swept and dragged the field that's right behind me, they probably just all deposited those rocks right through here. Similarly, if you look at the tree line that's down behind that brush pile, there's another stone wall that was probably collected from that field that's right behind me here. And so they were essentially just taking the rocks and moving them to the nearest location, but doing it in a way where it wasn't just randomly dropping rocks in places, they decided to make it functional and you could do something like pile them up and make a stone wall. And yes, on the tree line on the very other far end of this field, you'll find even more rock walls. But now this activity of picking up rocks and piling them up into a wall wasn't like a one and done situation. Like once you cleared this field, you could call it a day and you'd be done. You see, particularly here in Vermont, we have something known as frost heaves, which is when the ground freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws. That freezing and thawing action can often dredge up rocks and bring things up to the surface. That's why, for example, like when we were putting in the piers for our barn that we're building right now, we had to make sure that those piers were about six feet tall and we buried them underground. That way it's rooted below the frost line and it won't be subject to those frost heaves. But every spring when you have frost heaves out on here on this pasture, and I see it today even, what you find is new rocks just being brought up to the surface. And so, for example, as the Shaw family was working this farm, I would imagine that every year picking up rocks would have been an annual tradition. And the rock walls would get higher and higher and more of them would develop. And you're now left with the complex maze of rock walls that we have here in 2023 on our farm. And one of the things that's actually really interesting to me about these rock walls is how they use them to divide different fields. You know, if you look at a soil map of our farm, 
what you'll see is that the pasture that's directly behind me, that soil is a lot more muckier and clayer versus the soil of the field right here, which is like this beautiful sandy loam. It's like prime, like some of the best possible soil that you can have here in Vermont. And I'm almost certain that as they were clearing these fields and building these rock walls, they were using the rock walls to delineate between the different types of soil and the different types of fields, even if that's not how they would have described it if you had asked them back in, say, 1875. Now, before I listened to this Brave Little State podcast, I was definitely under the impression that, like, oh, that happened during the sheep boom. And when there was the sheep boom in Vermont, that's when they built all the walls and they used those walls to contain sheep. But the reality is that that's not directly the case, but it's sort of the case indirectly. Allow me to explain what I mean. You know, a few years back, before I had moved up to the farm, but after I had bought the farm, I let some friends of mine who were local sheep farmers actually bring their sheep here and they ran sheep through these pastures. It was a win-win situation, which helped me keep the pasture mowed, but it also gave them more grazing area so that they could hay their farm. And I remember they had sheep in the very spot that I'm standing in right now. And those sheep would easily be able to climb over rock walls. And while the rock walls deteriorated, so that probably made it easier, my impression is that a rock wall wouldn't really keep sheep out. But you can attribute a big part of the construction of these rock walls to the sheep boom. And by the way, if you're not familiar with the sheep boom, essentially in the 1800s here in Vermont, there was this massive boom and bubble of merino wool production here. Most of the mature forest was cut down and turned into grazing land. Thousands and maybe millions of merino sheep were starting to be raised here in Vermont. The state suddenly became 70% pasture and about 30% forest, even though today it's flipped around and it's now about 70% forest and 30% pasture. And massive tracts of land were cleared. When those tracts of land were cleared, it surfaced more of these stones and created opportunities to make more of these rock wall piling. And also remember a lot of the farmers and settlers who were in this area, they were coming from places like Ireland and Scotland and England where they are the wall building types to begin with. <laughs> And a lot of those folks brought that craft of old world building of stone walls here to Vermont. And later in the 1800s, when the sheep bubble burst, a lot of the farmers here decided to shift from doing sheep to dairy. And that's how Vermont became the dairy state that it was up until the 20th century. But even now that's starting to shift away. You know, for example, our farm for pretty much the entire existence of the Shaws was a dairy farm. And even my neighbors across the street who rented the land in the 70s and 80s and even into the early 90s, they were running dairy as well. But now most of those families in this town have gotten out of dairy and so it's kind of a dying industry. And what you have is this combination of either new forms of agriculture emerging on those old dairy farms or sadly they're just no longer farms. Which I guess means you can pour one out for nostalgia. But I'd be careful about getting too nostalgic because I know the question that many of you guys are going to probably have is what am I going to do about my stone walls? And the answer is no nothing. I'm just going to let them recede back into the earth and become nature. As you can see, I just let logs pile up and dead wood and grass and moss and lichens and like all of that stuff now covers this stone wall and I continue to let it grow. Ironically, as I build my new pasture fence, it's taking the very same line that was created by that stone wall and using it. So the legacy of the stone wall is going to continue, but I don't think that the stone wall itself is going to continue. I mean, look at this tree, right? This entire tree sprung up right from this rock wall and that to me is somewhat incredible you know it's funny as i was thinking about building this fence right here i was considering what materials to use and one thought i did have is do i try to repair the stone wall and when I talked to my buddy Alfred, he looked at me like I was absolutely insane. And so that's how I opted for these hybrid PVC and fiberglass fence posts. They're kind of nifty. They're bendy and they come pre-drilled so I can run high tensile wire, either electric or non-electric right through them. And they're actually made from recycled plastic. So it's kind of a good way to recycle and reuse some things that typically wouldn't be used for consumer purposes. Now these fence posts aren't gonna last forever though. I think the company gives you like a 20 year guarantee and they'll probably last, I don't know, 30 years max. And then they'll need to be replaced with something else, which I think is okay. You know, as much as we might feel nostalgic for the old stone wall and how much of a marker that is for old New England, the reality is it's not practical 
skeptical for supporting modern day agriculture and trying to build something here on our farm that's going to last a hundred years doesn't even make sense to me because I don't know that the farmers who are farming this land a hundred years from now are going to even want a fence like this. And so what I've come to the conclusion as I put infrastructure in place is not to necessarily try to leave this indelible permanent mark. What does indelible mean? I hate when I use words that I don't even know what they mean. Making marks that cannot be removed. Yes, okay. You know, I don't need to leave an indelible mark here on my farm. I just need to make sure I have the infrastructure I need to manage my farm the way I need it for today, but also just focus on leaving it in good shape and in good condition for the folks who come tomorrow. So I hope you've enjoyed this little walk through agricultural and New England history with me. If you want to learn more, seriously, check out the Brave Little State podcast. It was so well done. I'll leave a link for it down below and they do such a better job describing some of the things that I describe. But I figured I'd share this information with you guys. And now I'm also realizing it's starting to get dark and I should probably head back and do my evening chores. But thanks for watching everybody. By the way, don't forget to hit the subscribe button or watch just another video. And I'll be back soon with a new one. I just realized I can't end the video if I forget to take the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Ay, ay, ay.